turn to the book, we'll give a brief survey of it, Ezekiel. All right, chapters 1 to 24. The book divides itself into three parts. Chapters 1 to 24 is the prophet's denunciation of Judah and prediction of the fall of Jerusalem. Denunciation of Judah, prediction of the fall of Jerusalem. That's half of the book. Now remember, Ezekiel is a priest who gets a call to be a prophet. He is prophesying in captivity in Babylon. Daniel's already been taken, 606 B.C., and uh, Ezekiel in 597. And Jeremiah, we just looked at last time, he's still over in Jerusalem prophesying the same things there that Ezekiel is prophesying in captivity. That is the imminent fall of the nation of Judah, destruction of Jerusalem for their sins. Now, of course, in a survey, you can't look at all that's in Ezekiel 1 to 24. We'll do that when we study major prophets. It's one of the most interesting books in the Bible. But I'd like to point out some of the significant teachings and aspects. We might look at his call, first of all, because the vision and call is set forth in chapters 1 to 3. And the vision in chapter 1 is one of the most unique in the Bible. In fact, young Jews were not even supposed to read Ezekiel until they matured. And as we said last time, the book of Revelation picks up much of its symbolism from the book of Ezekiel, the living creatures, and so forth. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, that happens to be his 30th year, that's when he received his call. He's 30 years old. In the fifth day of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, he was taken with Jehoiakim. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. So we see he's a priest. In the land of the Chaldeans, that would be Babylonia, by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Ezekiel talks, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came down of the north, a great cloud of fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof the color of amber, out of the midst of fire. Now seeing a symbolic vision, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces, everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the soles of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like the color of burnished brass. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. They also had the face of an eagle. So they had four faces. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward, two wings of every one joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward, whither the Spirit was to go. They went, and they turned not when they went. And that's twice he said that. In other words, the way their wings were arranged and having faces and eyes looking in every direction, they had never had to turn to go anywhere. They could go in four directions without ever turning. And it's not just a symbol. These are not symbols, but uh, actually there are many. These are cherubim, a type of cherubim. Ezekiel identifies them as that in chapter 10. He sees another vision, and he says it's like the vision I saw uh, in chapter 1, except he doesn't say chapter 1, but his inaugural vision. And he calls them cherubim over there. And cherubim are always closely associated with God in his throne. To do, They run to do his bidding, they are protective and that sort of thing. And so, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. 
And the living creatures ran and returned. That's the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, you have to read this slowly to yourself to get the picture, but every time they move, it'd just be like a lightning flash out and back, just quicker than you could do it with your hand. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Actually, maybe it would help you to describe before we read it all, what we've got here is kind of a square and there's going to be established here the throne of God who's sitting on it and the four living creatures are on each side of that, that square. And beside each living creature is a wheel and it's full of eyes and the wheels are facing in four directions and so the throne of God doesn't have to turn, it just goes any way it wants. Just like the living creatures being having four faces and wings turned in such a way they never have to turn. And that speaks of swiftness, of course. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to the color of beryl, and their four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was like, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. These wheels were huge things reaching from heaven to earth, you see. He sees in the vision. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So it's not just a wheel, you see, it's some sort of a spirit form. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were the wings, their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on his side, and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. Of course, the pre-incarnate Son of God. And I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, had the brightness, had brightness round about it. Remember, God always appears in the fire, burning bush, Mount Sinai, day of Pentecost, tongues of fire, and Satan, being the counterfeiter, always counterfeits that, so he appears in the fire too and has his devotees walk through the fire all through the Old Testament, and they're still doing that sort of thing today. As the appearance of the bow that's in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of brightness round about it. Quite colorful, he's saying. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now he tells us what it all is, the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and heard a voice of one that spake. This is the vision which precedes his commission which speaks of God's omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, holiness, righteousness, his majesty, summed up in one word here, the glory of the Lord. Now there's quite a bit to do with that vision, a lot of attempted explanations and so forth. It's quite complicated, but some have even drawn pictures of it. You see a picture of it, you can get a little of more clearly set in your mind what's happening there. But it's a highly symbolic vision, so like the book of Revelation, they read chapter 1 of Ezekiel and say, well, let's go back to Isaiah. <laughs> because many things of God are not easily understood, but those things that we need to know are there, of course, but some things have deeper meanings and are even yet revealed. Well, he gets his commission. The Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, set me upon my feet. Heard him speaking to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I'll send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. He goes on to tell him that he'll send him to a people who won't even listen to him. But 
that's all right. God has a purpose. They're impotent children, verse 4, and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord. And then whatever God says. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will not hear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know there has been a prophet among them. That's all God is concerned about is you being faithful. Whether or not people listen to you is not your concern. Doesn't mean you should not pray and have compassion, but that isn't what he sent Ezekiel or you to do, to try by your methods, the methods of the world, as the denominations have done, to try to win men by the methods of the business world. Pragmatism. The end justifies the means. He just said, go preach the word. Be faithful. God has a people who will hear. People today are not used to hearing prophetic messages. They don't quite know what to do with the ministry here. Some people. They think you're so far out in orbit you'll never get back. <laughs> they don't mind telling you too. Yeah, we're so far out. That's right. <laughs> but the average person in the denominational church, when he gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's never heard prophetic preaching and teaching, and they don't know, they don't know what to do with it. That's why most charismatics stop at Pentecost, because our message is too strong. And I'm going to say it. You get prophetic teaching and preaching here. I shouldn't have to say it. That ought to be obvious. Now, if you don't know what is meant by prophetic preaching, why well, keep coming and you'll hear it. <laughs> so he tells them to go. Then, verse 8, tells him not to be rebellious like Israel, speak his words. In verse 9, when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and a roll of book was there. Now, remember, they didn't have books like this. They had scrolls. So he sees a scroll, not a roll, but a scroll. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, mourning and woe. That's his message. You sure you want to be a prophet? Lamentations, mourning and woe. And this is a part of what we mean by prophetic preaching. It doesn't tickle the ear. It isn't designed to win the shallow and the rebellious. It is faithfulness to the Word of God. And as I said recently to somebody, you don't know what prophetic preaching is because if, if we are to tone down our message here, which it was suggested we do, then we'll have to fault Jesus We'll have to fault Paul. He should have never written Galatians. And we'll have to just throw out all the prophets. Because you have never read the Old Testament if you can find a prophet that doesn't preach anything but lamentation, mourning, and woe. That's what a prophet does. You say, how about consolation, edification, comfort? That's your calling, church. 1 Corinthians 14, minister that to us. But prophets don't preach that. Oh, I didn't say they never preached any hope that's in the midst of lamentation mourning and woe you'll always find in the midst of their preaching of judgment against sin you'll find a message of hope held out for the obedient so we've got chapters 40 to 48 which does that in Ezekiel but prophetic preaching most people can't handle it because they've never heard it well he said eat the scroll. <laughs> Symbolically, of course, he's in the spirit, so he ate the scroll. And he said, eat the roll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this message, this scroll that I give thee. Then did I eat it? And look at what he said. In my mouth it was as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, get thee to the house of Israel, and speak my words unto them, for thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many of a strange peace and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. <laughs> he said, if I'd have sent you to somebody who couldn't understand you, they'd have listened. In other words, they would have responded more quickly than my own people who can understand your words. Even though they couldn't have understood, they would have responded before Israel. 
But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Well, then why go? Well, he already told you. So they'll know my prophet has been among them. That's all God needs is your faithfulness. He never, ever in all the Bible said, go get a large crowd to follow you. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Paul, anybody else. John 6 is not for the novice or the shallow. Jesus lost all but the twelve. It says they all left him but the twelve. And he turned to them and said, will you also go away? <laughs> He's son of God. Something wrong when the world's following your message. Then through a series of symbolic acts, here's another reason why people who say they want to be prophets ought to examine the prophets. And I'm not at all discrediting the idea. <laughs> but a lot of people have a lot of dreamy notions about what prophets and prophetesses do. He'll send you up to Washington state capital and prophesy judgment that the communists are going to rape your wives and carry away this nation. You won't be popular. You'll be imprisoned. <laughs> but here's some other things he had to do. He, he had to act like he lost his mind. In fact, in I think it's chapter 19 or 20, he said, Lord, how much longer do I have to preach and act out some of these prophecies? They're saying he's lost his mind. So he gets a brick. We can't read all this in a survey. He gets a brick and draws the city of Jerusalem on it and then gets down like a little kid playing with marbles and, you know, playing cowboys and Indians or forts and so forth. And he lays siege against that brick. What are you doing, Ezekiel? He said, I'm overcoming Jerusalem. I'm Nebuchadnezzar. And then they shake their head and thought, well, <laughs> we always said he was a religious extremist. And then about four of them here in chapters four to eight. Then he's to lie on his left side for so many weeks, and then so many weeks and months on his right side. What are you doing, Ezekiel? Why don't you ever get out of bed? The time's coming when you'll be as helpless as I am. It was a message, you see. And on and on. And God told him in chapter 5, take a barber's razor and cut off some of your hair and hide a little bit in the skirt of your garment. That'll be the remnant I'll save out of Israel. Then cast the rest of it in the fire. When they ask you why you're burning your hair off, Tell them, that's Israel, that's going to destruction. Then he told him in another symbolic act, all these are symbolic prophecies. Told him in another symbolic act, eat cow's dung, because they would be glad to get that in the siege of Jerusalem. And he begged out of that when the Lord let him. <laughs> but generally, the Lord requires it. If he tells you to do something, you better do it. <laughs> Chapters 8 to 12 is worth your reading in one sitting because here we have a vision he's carried in the spirit back to Jerusalem from Babylon and there shown the abominations that's taking place in the city that right in the temple heathen idols and worship sodomy prostitution and all sacred prostitution the whole bit going on right in the temple it's so abominable God can't do anything but destroy it so what's he going to do with the gay people in the churches that are liberated churches today, Methodists and Presbyterian and Lutheran and some Baptists, saying that's just their form of sexual expression, and who are we to judge it? Just as a for instance, they ought to read the Old Testament, what God does with people like that. Chapter 13, he deals with the false prophets in Jerusalem. In, in Babylon, there are false prophets everywhere. Thus saith the Lord, Woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Ye have not gone up into the gaps. Ye have not made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. Now, for those who need to hear it, whether it's here this morning or on the tapes, so many people come to me and say, but, but this prophet or this person stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord. And you can tell they've never read the Bible. Well, anyone can say, Thus saith the Lord. 
They know there's something wrong with it, but they say, well, it was a prophecy, as if there weren't two kinds of prophecies. So I never cease to be amazed at such statements, but there are just a lot of people that do not know there is false prophecy. So he said, they say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord says, I have not sent them. They made others to hope that they would confirm the word. You've seen a vain vision. You've spoken a lying divination. You see, it wasn't word of knowledge, it was divination. And there are people today in charismatic circles who have spirits of divination. And you have to be able to discern the difference. The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken, God says. Because you've spoken vanity, you've seen lies. He didn't say they didn't see visions, but they were lying visions from the wrong source. He said, I'm against you. Mine hands shall be upon the prophets that see vanity, their divine lives. Vanity means emptiness, nothing. Well, quite a denunciation there against false prophecy. Chapter 16 would be worth your reading at one sitting also. It's the allegory of the foundling child, how God found her as an orphan to Israel. She was a filthy, abominable thing. When she came out of Egypt, he cleaned her up, gave her everything, and then she played the harlot on him, turned against him. Verse 35, for example. Wherefore, O harlot, he calls her a harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out, thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms, with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and by the blood of thy children which thou didst give to them, behold, therefore I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, and all them that thou hast hated. I will gather them round about against thee, and they will discover thy nakedness. Chapter 22 in this section is important too because it speaks of the fact that each man will be judged according to his own works. See, the proverb, it's called the proverb of sour grapes. The proverb was that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge, which meant that the children are being punished for their father's sins. And that is also a law. That's in the law, the Ten Commandments. To those who get involved in the occult, go after other gods, and that's what that is, God's judgment will go down to the fourth generation of those who do that. But Ezekiel comes now with a, a very advanced teaching that each person will be judged for his own sins, that each man will be judged guilty or not guilty according to his own deeds. Did I say chapter 22? I meant chapter 18. I'm sorry. Chapter 18, what mean ye, ye that use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. If a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and so forth, and he tells what that means, that he will be rewarded for that. But if he is sinful, each man is going to be judged for his own sin. Verse 19, yet you say, why? Does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes, and has done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father. Neither the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now that's quite an advance in theology in the Old Testament because God was showing individual punishment and guilt. Chapter 28 is very significant. Oh, let's see. Now we've come to a new division in the outline. That was 1 to 24 against Judah and Jerusalem. Then we've got prophecies against foreign nations, chapters 25 to 32. All the major prophets deliver prophecies against the foreign nations, not just Israel. 
because their ministry was worldwide, universal. Again, that's the uh, evidence that one is a prophet. He isn't always prophesying to a local body somewhere, but his prophecies are universal in scope. Uh, so I started to say chapter 28 is quite significant because here we have a picture of the fall of Satan. It begins with a description or a prophecy against Tyre, Sidon, the king of Tyre, moves on beyond him to someone that was in the Garden of Eden and uh, who was before the throne of God and who fell from original perfection. And certainly king of Tyre was never perfect in beauty and wisdom and so on. So in verse 11, he moves from his address to the king of Tyre now to someone else. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. But notice he can't be speaking of him. Thus saith the Lord, thou, thou that sealest up the sun, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. See, none of that would be said of an earthly king. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, certainly he wasn't there. Every precious stone was I covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, so on. The workmanship of thy tabarets and of thy pipes were, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. He's talking about his beauty of voice, his tabarets, tabarets, his pipes. Thou art the anointed cherub. See, he was one of the cherubim, created being. Thou art the anointed cherub. Certainly never been said of king of Tyre. The cherub that covereth. Covereth what? The throne of God. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. It's never said of man that he was created after Adam. From then on, he's begotten in Scripture. So we're talking about something else besides a man. It said, you were perfect from the day you were created till iniquity was found in thee. So why did he fall? Verse 16, he calls him the covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Why did he fall? Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He must have been the most beautiful creature in the universe outside God himself. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So God says he'll cast him out. So Ezekiel is very important, Ezekiel 28, for some information about the origin and fall of Satan, which we have nowhere else in Scripture. Now God would have never included all of that information there if he was just speaking about the king of Tyre, but it's quite evident that he isn't. Then the third section of the book, Prophecies of Israel's Future Restoration, chapters 33 to 48. Here we come back into the message of hope, as I said, that you'll find in, in all the prophets. Even in the little prophet Obadiah, you've got a couple of verses of hope in the midst of judgment. Now, in 33 to 39, you have prophecies of events preceding the millennium. Prophecies of events preceding the millennium. And that has to be read together. But here you have uh, the prophecy concerning the Valley of Dry Bones in chapter 37, which speaks of Israel's national resurrection. The vision of the valley of dry bones, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me in the spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Then he asked Ezekiel a question, can these bones live? Well, he said, Lord, you know. Well, he says, prophesy to them. So when he prophesied to them, then the song, you know how it goes, bone upon bone, thigh bone on the thigh bone on the hip bone, knee bone on the thigh bone. You ever heard that Negro spiritual? All right. That's where they got it, right here. So he prophesied to it and he saw the bones. He saw a skeleton coming back together and then sinews and muscles and flesh and all, but there was no life in it. Well, he said prophesy again. And then the Spirit of the Lord came in and it lived. 
Verse 11 tells us what it means. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we're cut off for our parts. See, captivity, they're going to be there 70 years. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Behold, O people, I will open your graves, I'll cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. He isn't talking about the resurrection of the body, but national resurrection. The Old Testament does speak of the resurrection of the body, but in Isaiah, but this isn't it. This is national resurrection. And you shall know that I'm the Lord. Remember we said that phrase occurs 60 times or more in Ezekiel. That's the key phrase. He'll do all things, judgment or restoration, so you'll know I'm the Lord. When I've opened your graves, I'll put my spirit in you, and you'll live. I'll place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord that has spoken and performed it. Vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, these are all prophecies preceding the millennium. He's going to restore them first. Then you have the prophecy of the destruction of Israel's enemies, chapters 38 and 39. Gog and Magog. Literally, Gog, who is the king of the land of Magog. And this is also used, this terminology, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, where Gog and Magog stand for all the enemies of God after the millennium that God destroys. But here you have Israel's deliverance before the millennium by the supernatural intervention of God. I think we have a tape on that. Russia is quite clearly depicted here as coming against Israel. And let me say this. God didn't write Russia in the Bible. But there's every... If you look at the terminology here and do some deep study on it, it seems quite well that we've got names that describe the Russians. And it appears that Russia isn't going to be defeated by America. God himself is going to defeat her in the land of Israel before millennium and before Armageddon. This isn't Armageddon here. This is the destruction of the northern enemies of Israel. See, Russia has had her hand right in the middle of the Mideast for years. That's where the wealth, the oil, the Dead Sea alone could support the world for many generations. The wealth in the Dead Sea alone. It's untapped, filled with minerals. And according to this passage, that's where God will deal with Russia. So as I've said so many times, keep your eyes on Israel. It's God's calendar. What happens to Israel tells you what's going to be fulfilled next in the Bible. And the Bible tells you a lot of things to watch for. I recognize again, most churches never told you to expect anything to happen, but they're kind of having to change some of that. When Jesus said that Jerusalem would be given back, they, first he said that Israel would get her nation back, an impossible thing for centuries, then just happened in 48 overnight, then she'd get her city back. He said when that happened, he said that generation will not pass away till everything has been fulfilled. So some are having to reevaluate their unbelief and say maybe the Bible knows what it's talking about. <laughs> Speaking about prophets, back in an earlier passage, the day that Jerusalem was besieged, God told Ezekiel his wife was going to die, and that would be another symbol. And you're not to mourn her, you're not to hold a funeral, just bury her. And when they ask you why are you acting strangely that you don't even shed a tear for the desire of your eyes, your wife, say that's what's going to happen to you very soon. Jerusalem's getting ready to fall. And people won't even have time to mourn. They'll be too busy escaping. So, again, a prophet. God took his wife away that day. She didn't die of a cancer. He just took her home. So, again, prophets have quite a calling to live up to. I told Jeremiah not to even marry. You'll be a symbol to those who wish they hadn't. They won't have time to wait for the children and wives when I destroy Jerusalem. Chapters 40 to 48 are prophecies concerning the millennium. 
prophecies during the millennium. We have a restoration of the temple, the worship, and the land to Israel. Restoration of the temple, worship, and the land. And it's all to be different. It's not to be the temple of Solomon or of Herod, the temple of Jesus' day. Everything's to be different. The worship is different. There's some similarities. There's sacrifice during the millennium and all that, but it is a different type, and there's no day of atonement. There's no high priest. See, it's not a going back to the, what some call the beggarly elements of the Old Testament uh, during the millennium, but the Jews' worship and sacrifice and temple will all be restored, but it's all different, even the redistribution of the land. But we'll save that for the study of the book itself sometime. That's Ezekiel. That's Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Now we come to the minor prophets. Not minor because they're less important, but because their books are generally smaller. I mean, the longest minor prophet is 14 chapters. The shortest is 21 verses. And your major prophets are 48 chapters, 66 chapters, 52 chapters, you see. Do uh, Orthodox Jews then, in the reestablishment of the temple and everything, do they look then at Ezekiel's pattern, or do they go clear back to the Levitical pattern when they pray for the reestablishment of their temple? They never see Ezekiel, when I say never, maybe some do, but to answer your question as simply as possible, they're thinking about reestablishing Mosaic worship, Moses' temple. No, the temple of Ezekiel is definitely supernatural. You see, you have to really get into that because when you start laying out the dimensions and all, it won't even fit over there. There's not enough land. And again, God doesn't say it all in a chapter or, or give it all to one prophet, but if you take all the prophecies, like Zechariah, he says that in that day, God's going to level the mountains over there, and there's going to be a change in the topography. And so the temple and city of Ezekiel would have to have more space or it'd end up in the Mediterranean Sea. But the point is, the scriptures teach there will be a change in topography. It says that in several passages. And people who don't know the Old Testament throw out Ezekiel 40 to 48 because they say, well, just figure the dimensions and there's no way that that could fit there. But Ezekiel's temple has a supernatural river flowing out from the throne of God that waters the whole land and the millennium is going to be a time of Edenic, restoration of the Garden of Edenic conditions. All right, the minor prophets. Their ministry, chronologically, we're talking of time now, ranges from the 9th century B.C. to the 5th century B.C. That's the period of their prophecy. Now that's a half a millennium. That's what we're talking about. All the way from Obadiah to Malachi. And what we have in their prophecies, it covers such a broad range of time. We have the moral, spiritual, political situation of Israel and Judah described for us. The moral, political, spiritual conditions for half a millennium described for us. Now the arrangement of the 12 minor prophets, you should memorize them, the arrangement of the 12 minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible is for a purpose. They've arranged them on the basis of the following chronological principle. You've got great nations that conquered Israel and that Israel was constantly at war against you know, her enemies. So we have great periods like the Assyrian period, the Babylonian period, the Greek period, and the Roman period. And so those minor prophets are arranged in the Hebrew Bible according to those periods. The first prophets that occur are the prophets of the Assyrian period. That's Hosea to Nahum, the prophets of the Assyrian period. Hosea to Nahum. 
And then follow the prophets of the Babylonian period, that is, those who prophesied when Babylon was ruling the world. The Babylonian period, Habakkuk and Zephaniah. Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And then the prophets of the Persian period, that would be after the exile, 70 years captivity, that would be Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now, Hosea doesn't come first because he was the first to prophesy. Chronologically, Obadiah is the oldest minor prophet. He is way back in the 9th century B.C. Obadiah is the oldest of the minor prophets, the oldest book. Why does Hosea come first than in the English and Hebrew arrangement? Probably for the simple reason that it's the longest of the books and he exercised his ministry longer than probably any other prophet. If I remember right, it's over 60 years he prophesied. That's quite a long ministry. Hosea stands first because probably uh, it's the longest of that first period, not the longest of the minor prophets because Zechariah is the same length, 14 chapters, but the longest of the Assyrian period and because he prophesied longer. But remember, Obadiah comes first, so we'll look at Obadiah first. And Obadiah comes forth here. Hosea, Joel, Amos, and if I figured that right, Obadiah ought to be next. Yep, Obadiah. If you can find Hosea, then just count four books and you'll find it. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. If we ask you what's the shortest book, don't give us a psalm. Hobart knows that. Somebody sent him information once when he made a statement. He said, doesn't he know about psalm so-and-so? That's just two verses? Yeah. I was talking about books of the Bible, not psalms. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. 21 verses. That's pretty short. The occasion for the writing of it. See, every prophet has a reason for writing. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are preaching against the sins of Judah, its imminent fall, and its ultimate restoration. So every prophet will have a purpose. The occasion for Obadiah's prophecy, a calamity that had befallen Jerusalem. Now, this is back before Jerusalem became sinful. This way back in 9th century B.C a calamity that had befallen Jerusalem in which the Edomites, and the Edomites, remember, are brothers of the Israelites, Jacob and Esau. The Edomites had displayed unbrotherly conduct toward the Jews. When an enemy came against Jerusalem, we're saying the Edomites shared in the plunder of the city, selling Jews into slavery, and in ridiculing them because of their distress. That's the theme of this little prophecy. The destruction of Edom and the exaltation of Israel is the theme of the prophecy. Obadiah is a prophecy against the land of Edom, her brother. We'll date this prophecy 845 B.C. Remember we said all prophecies are dated at the approximate beginning of the prophet's ministry. 845 B.C. That would be 9th century. Nothing is known of the prophet outside his book. His name means Obediah, what? Servant of Yahweh. Remember, all names mean something. Oved, yeah. I'd have to see the Hebrew Bible to know the exact pronunciation of his name. That's probably a long E. It's probably Oved, yeah. Obadiah is easy to finish. Let's look at Obadiah. 21 verses, I believe we can make it. At least I can say I did two prophets in one hour. 
I've been working toward that for several weeks. All right. Here's a brief outline. Let me give you a brief outline of Ovid Yah. The destruction of Edom predicted, verses 1 to 9. That was fulfilled because those of you who saw the films I took over there of Petra, all those red sandstone cliffs and the temples and all, Edom didn't live down there. She was up on top of those huge cliffs. The only way in there is a little narrow gorge where you saw me riding a horse down, about that wide, and they could easily defend that. And so they were proud, and that's the picture you get here. They're an eagle up on a rock, proud. Who can bring me down? Nobody. But God said, I'll bring you down. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. So God's calling the heathen nations to destroy Edom. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. See, they're not destroyed yet, but prophecy is in the past tense. See, I have made thee small. God's already done it. Why? The pride of thine heart has deceived thee, thou, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. See, they think no one can get up to them. God's already up there. He's above them. Yeah, I'll bring you down. If thieves come to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If thy grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? But God saying that your enemies will leave you nothing. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy, even their allies, are going to go against them. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Teman, which was a capital, was noted for its wise men, mentioned in the book of Job. One of the men, Job's friends, was from Teman. And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau shall be cut off by slaughter. So that's the prophecy of her destruction. And verses 10 to 14, he gives the causes for this judgment, causes for the judgment. What Esau, what Edom did. Why? For thy violence done against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast one of them. You see, Frequently, enemies would come against defended fenced cities, walled cities, and so forth. And here is a time when an enemy came against Jerusalem. When we study in detail the minor prophets, then we'll discuss who these enemies are. But anyway, this enemy that came against Jerusalem, at that time, Edom, rather than helping her brother, stood by and mocked and ridiculed as they were carried captive when the Fugitives would try to escape, they would bring them back, and they would help them sell them into slavery, and they also helped plunder the city. Notice these things come out. You should not have looked upon the day of your brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Then the rest of the book, 15 to 21, he moves into the future day of the Lord. Always in the Old Testament, day of the Lord means end time. It may include some reference to Israel in her restoration to her land after the Babylonian captivity and that sort of thing, as in some prophets. But the day of the Lord always speaks of the day that's just over the horizon. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. See, he moves out to the world. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. 
For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, they shall swallow down, they shall be as though there had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. See, there's your hope. Mount Zion, Jerusalem, Israel, the people of God. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. That's where I got the title to the phrase I'm always using in a sermon I have preached, Possessing Your Possessions. That day they'll possess their possessions. Everything is theirs, everything is yours. I encourage people to use faith and possess your possessions. They're there. If you don't take them, why, it doesn't mean they're not promised. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and there shall not be anything remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. So today it's just a desolate land, and Israel is back in her land. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau. They of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors, literally deliverers, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is the first clear mention. This is the earliest prophecy, you see. This is before Isaiah or any of them. He's the first writing prophet here. This is the first mention of a kingdom going to be established, you see. This is three centuries before Daniel who speaks of the kingdom. Now that's significant. Verse 21, that deliverers will come, and that speaks not just of deliverers for Israel, but these end time deliverance ministries and deliverance in the body of Christ. You see, there are various levels of spiritual truth. And the speaks of deliverance coming to the body of Christ, too. And the kingdom is the Lord's.